Good to see. I don't know how much preaching I have to do after all of that that we just experienced. God is still moving. Can I get an amen? Amen. Hey, would you do me one more favor? Welcome those who are joining us online. God bless you guys. Thank you from wherever you find yourself today. So we're continuing on in this series called Jesus Stories. And the one thing I want you to think about from the beginning is the fact that these stories we're reading about and learning about are not just average everyday stories. I know my tendency is after reading the Bible over and over again, sometimes I look at them and I'm like, ah, so-and-so got raised from the dead. So-and-so had demons cast out of them. And it almost seems like second nature and I can overlook them. By the very nature of what we're talking about, these are extraordinary stories, extraordinary. God is doing something in the midst of them. Let us not forget that today. By definition, the word miracle means a surprising and welcoming event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of divine agency, right? That means the stories that we're talking about are divine in nature. Let's not take that for granted today. These miracles are incredible. And if you need one today, as you heard from the youth just a little bit earlier, God's here in this place. And maybe today is the day that you will get the miracle that you've been praying and believing for. May God open our eyes so that we might see these stories as such today. Pastor Adam shared last week about the fact that the stories that we read in the Bible, the 36, 37 stories of miracles of Jesus, are not the only stories. It actually says in Scripture in John 21, 25, and there were also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. God continues to write those stories in our generation. This isn't just a history book. This is a book for today, amen? God still moves today. God still delivers today. God still sets free today. God still heals today. God can still raise the dead. Am I in the right church or not? I don't know. Y'all seem like you were worshiping just a little bit harder earlier. Extraordinary stories. And there's one central figure in each and every one of these stories, none other than Jesus Christ the son of the living God who died on a cross that you and I might have life. The very knowledge of him, the very reading of scripture ultimately leads us to a point where we have to make a decision. Jesus himself described this decision that needed to be made when he talked to Peter in Matthew 16, 13. Now when the son of man came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some, John the Baptist, others said, Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. If you've never made that decision before, it's the most important decision that you need to make. Was Jesus just a good man? Was he a prophet of old? Or is he the son of God? Because if he's the son of God, that changes everything, right? It changes everything. He is worthy to be worshipped, honored, and adored. Lord, as we get into your word today, would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us the power to believe, Lord God? Father, would you lead us to a place of decision that, Father, if we haven't said that Jesus, you were Lord of our life, that today would be the day that we would do that. If we have, would we fall ever so more deeply in love with you by the words that we hear this morning? Lord, touch our hearts, guide us, direct us, change us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible with you today, and I do encourage you to bring a Bible because you gotta check what I preach, right? John chapter 11 is where we're going to be today, and I'm going to go a little bit old school, and we're going to do a little bit of verse by verse, chapter by chapter through John chapter 11. It's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. 
Can you imagine somebody being raised from the dead first and foremost? Can you even imagine it? Before that moment, the only other Bible story I could think of was the time Elijah raised the widow's son, right? So this in their midst, I I would pray, Lord, just take us for a moment to that place to where this story was happening. Could we get a visual, oh God, of what was going on in that day and the hearts and minds of the people that surrounded and made up this story that we're still reading and is still impacting people in our own generation. Let's dive right in. John 11, 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. First off, Lazarus, right? It says he's very sick. Start to imagine the context. I don't know if you've been in that place. I have. I've been to that place where you don't know if you're going to live or die. If you haven't experienced it yourself, there's probably people in your life that you know that have, right? Think of the emotional state that those people must have been in as this story's starting to open up. Lazarus isn't like just sick with a cold. He's sick unto death, right? They could see it on him. They see that something's seriously wrong with him. They're concerned. They love him. They don't want him to die. They want him to be there with them. So there's this emotional state that's going on right as this story is beginning. His two sisters are there, Mary and Martha. Mary is Mary Magdalene, the former prostitute. John writes this in retrospect, right? He says, this is Mary. He's giving us context. The one who wept at Jesus' feet. The one who anointed Jesus' feet. That story ends up happening about six days before he goes to the cross. So John's pulling this together so that we understand who this is. But it also gives us some good context to know that he knew Mary back then, but he also sees Mary at the end right there in those waning days before he's getting ready to go to the cross. This is a lifelong relationship and friendship. An intimacy was there between them, right? John eleven three. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he, served, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So I love how they kind of present their case to Jesus. I, I shared with you that there was, they were friends. There was an intimacy between them. So they're like, Jesus, the one whom you love, Lazarus is ill and he might die. So they're kind of playing on that emotion just a little bit, right? I would, wouldn't you? You've seen them heal other people like, Jesus, come on, will you come through for us? And then all of a sudden he starts to say like, yeah, everything's going to be okay. I'll be there in a few days. It's all going to work out. Don't worry, he's not going to die. That's a critical moment there for him as well, right? Because guess what? He does die, right? He's not going to die. It's all going to be okay. Just think of the emotions you would be going through in the midst of this. Lazarus, one of your best friends, the one whom you love. Man, the one who would be there even later after this. Think about this for a second. You don't really hear about Lazarus in the rest of the Bible. There's only really one other verse about it. In that final scene where Mary is anointing his feet, there's a talk of Lazarus being there reclining at the table. But the beautiful thing that that tells me, again, is this level of intimacy that this family had. You know, oftentimes we think of just the 12 disciples, right? But we don't think of all those other friends that he had around him. And I share that to tell you that that's the same level of relationship he wants with you. When we talk about Jesus loves you and wants you in his life, And vice versa, the kind of love that you're seeing him express here is the kind of love that he has for you. Some of you might not believe that right now, but I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely true. He wants this level of relationship with you. These people are there with him, doing life with him all the way up until the very, very end. The same time that scripture tells us Jesus didn't go. He actually tells them that Lazarus is not going to die, yet he stays two days longer. Important for the context of the story. John 11, 7. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. 
The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of his world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I think what Jesus is really saying there is, guys, I kind of know what I'm doing. (laughs) You know, I'm the light of the world. I know what's going on. There's a purpose here. Don't worry. We're going to be safe. After these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Remember here in this next contest, they were hearing this story where Jesus said, Lazarus isn't going to die. So then they start to respond. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's falling asleep, he's going to recover. Everything's going to be okay. Remember, you said he's not going to die. But then Jesus has to turn to him and said, guys, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I was glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Let us go to him. How confusing even for them, right? After they see him, they see all the miracles. That What? Lazarus is dead? What the heck's going on here, God? You said he wasn't going to die. What in the world? Could you imagine the emotions even that you're feeling right now, I hope? Then Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we might die with him. I wonder if Jesus ever got frustrated with him. (laughs) Hey, he's asleep. Dude, he's dead. Come on, but it's all going to work out, right? I know he must get frustrated with me sometimes because I'm a knucklehead. How about you? Anybody here? You think Jesus probably gets a little frustrated with you from time to time? That's okay. He learned from the best, apparently. John 11:17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. You're in the tomb for four days, you're dead, dead, not just dead, right? You're not coming back in the natural. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and Mary, one of the Jews, had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary remained seated at the house. I start to think about their character and their nature and then seeing them in other places in Scripture at the same time. At this particular moment, Mary's in the house, right? Right? What, this would be me too. I'd probably be there right with Mary. Jesus said he was going to save him. Jesus didn't show up. Man, I'd be grumpy. I don't know about you, right? I'd be a little bit upset. So she's probably there sulking. I'm embellishing just a little bit, but doesn't it sound like it? But after this experience, when you see Mary the next time, what does she end up doing? She's totally transformed. She's running out to Jesus. She's crying and weeping at his feet. She's praying. She can't get enough of it. She's worshiping the king of kings. Look at how God used instances like this in her life where she was sulking, where she was worried, where she didn't trust in Jesus. And then all of a sudden, when you fast forward to the end of the story, she's the one there at his feet, anointing his feet, running to King Jesus. Right now, you might be hiding in that closet, wondering if God's going to come through on your behalf. Right now, you might be getting grumpy in the midst of the wait. But let me tell you, Jesus is still in control. Amen. Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Probably with tears in her eyes. Lord, you disappointed me. Lord, I trusted you. You said he wasn't going to die, but he died. If you would have only been here. Sometimes God's ways are different than our ways. But do you trust him in the middle of it? But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha says correctly to him, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Christians, 2,000 years later, do you believe this? She answers much like Peter in that moment. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. 
who is coming into the world, ultimately to save all of mankind. This is one of the most challenging parts of this story for me because I can relate to maybe Martha, I could relate to Mary. I am terrible in the wait. I am terrible in that moment between the prayer and the promise being fulfilled. I am terrible in the midst of hearing and believing and understanding one thing, but then God putting that on pause for whatever reason and having to be in the middle. If I'm honest with you, I don't always react the best way that I should. I continue to act in fear. I continue to walk in anxiety. I continue to walk at times in disbelief, and maybe you do too. But I'm here to share with you today that there's a better path. What if you could praise God in the middle of the wait? What if you could trust God in the middle of the wait? What if you could rejoice in the middle of the wait? See, fear, anxiety, all those things don't add a day to your life, right? You either trust God and believe that he's the son of God, and if you do, that changes everything, or you don't. And if you don't, maybe today's the day where you do. May this story that we're hearing and learning about change our very lives. Think back to Peter for a moment. The same Peter who earlier in our sermon correctly stated that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Note that Peter walked with him, that Peter saw all the miracles. Peter had been there and witnessed even Lazarus being raised from the dead. And then it gets to that point where Jesus is on the cross and Jesus dies and he's got to wait three days between the death and the promise to be fulfilled. And what does he do? He denies Jesus three times. Don't be a Peter. Come on, Lord, right? Don't be a Peter. As the famous poet philosopher Tom Petty once sang, the waiting is the hardest part. Right? He sang it really weird though. <laughs> it is, is it not? The waiting is the hard part. I say again, journey, I encourage you to do different, to trust God in the waiting, to praise God in the waiting, to stand on verses like Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. See, Martha was right to a degree. Jesus had told her he wasn't going to die, yet there he was. She's saying that, yeah, one day he'll rise again at the end. And Jesus obviously had some different plans in the midst of it. Know this, God's plans are always better than our plans, even if we don't understand them, right? John eleven twenty eight. 28. When she had said this, she went and called Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Man, I think about this for a minute for you who are here today that feel neglected, that feel rejected. Mary's in there sulking in the back, right? Jesus probably intuitively, supernaturally knows this. And he's like, go get Mary. I want her to come here. I want to be with those I love. You know, the devil sadly distorts even some of these stories trying to say that Jesus had some crazy relationship with her and things like that. You hear from all these crazy people that talk like that. Said that Jesus loved Mary, he loved Martha, he loved Lazarus. He had an intimate, loving, nice, wonderful, you know, platonic, incredible relationship with all of them. But he loved her enough in the midst of her pain. He knew her pain. He says, bring Mary to me. That she could hang out. I want to comfort her. I want to be there with her. How incredible is that? I lost my track. Come on, Jesus. She was still in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews were here in the house, consoling her, saw Mary arise and go quickly out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying... Lord, if you had only been here, you might think the same thing. He's always there. He's always there. My brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Then she said, Lord, come see. In the shortest verse of the Bible, it says, Jesus wept. 
he felt their pain, even though he knew he's about to go raise them from the dead. He's like, it's going to be over in just a minute, people. It's going to go from weeping and crying to, have you ever seen a dead man walk? Have you ever seen a dead man walk? Right? But he takes the time to share in their pain, to share in their grief, to share in that moment, knowing that in just a moment, everything's about to change. So the Jews said, see how he loved them? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? See, there were those who were about to rejoice and those who were there to scoff. I don't know if you're here as a scoffer. I don't know if you walked in here with some sense of unbelief, but I pray that if you did, that God has maybe moved on your heart and touched you and that you could see him for who he really is. See the compassion in his heart that you would reject the things and the lies of the devil and that you would see him for who he really is. And if you find yourself in the middle of that moment between the pain and the promise, know that Jesus has heard your prayer. He knows, he cries with you, and maybe, just maybe, today could be your day of breakthrough. See, breakthrough is about to happen. John eleven thirty eight. 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, it was a cave, and a stone lay against it, and Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Are you crazy, God? What are you doing? What are you going to do going and open up that tomb after all this time? Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted his eyes and said a prayer to the Father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with strips and his face with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. How extraordinary. Jesus went there on a mission to prove that he was the son of God, and he did so by raising him from the dead four days after he had been put into the grave. This is like the highest level of miracle, right? If God can perform that miracle, what miracle are you believing for that you're saying that he can't do in your life? If he could do that, he could do anything, right? <clears throat> There's a little nugget in the midst of that that gave the purpose of why he was there. If I were to paraphrase just slightly, he said, the reason that I performed this story, this miracle, and that I'm sharing with you this story today, it said that God might be glorified and that those who were there would believe. It's the same purpose for us in this very room today. That story still is changing lives. That story is still saving people, right? that God would be glorified and that we would believe. I want to do a slight sidebar for a second, Journey. May there never be a week that goes by that we come into this place and that people don't walk up to the front and give their lives to Jesus. There's a dual responsibility in that, though, that I'm sharing. And maybe when I was a full-time lead pastor, I hesitated at times to share stuff like this because it would seem that there could be a false motive. When I would tell you to go out there into the streets, into the highways and the byways and go evangelize and go share and invite people in, there could be a false motive in that if I was the lead pastor, right? Hey, the more people, the more glory God gets, but hey, I feel a little bit better because the building's full, you know. There could be a duality of that, but today I could say that in total clean conscience, even though I think I did before as well. The only one who would get the glory is God the Father, but what a tragedy it is when a service goes by and nobody raises their hand because we didn't do our jobs to go out there and bring people in. The church must grow and we have a dual responsibility in that. We certainly can't get anybody saved, but we need to do the work of going out there and bringing them in to the foot of the cross so that they could hear the story of the good news of the gospel, right? So I challenge you, even in the midst of this, to be about bringing people into the church. 
not for the church's sake, but for the sake of those who need to know Jesus in this lost and hurting generation, may we prioritize that in our own lives to see people get saved. Amen? I'm almost done. Journey, I espouse to you that prior to getting saved, we are all dead men and women walking. When somebody gets saved, it is every bit as much of a miracle as was experienced with Lazarus. Let me prove my point. Ephesians 2, 1. And you were what? In your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and mind that were by the very nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in his mercy because of his great love for which he loved us, just like he loved Mary, just like he loved Martha, just like he loved Lazarus, he loves you in that same way, right? Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us come together alive in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Doesn't it sound like the same purpose that in our salvation, in our raising from the dead, God would be glorified and others would marvel and come to know him as Savior and the kingdom of God would expand until the day that he returns. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those good works are going and getting other people to the foot of the cross. Getting saved is every bit as much of a miracle as seeing Lazarus raised from the dead. God transforms our dead spirits instantly to become alive in him. Through baptism, as was shared earlier, we go public with our faith and outwardly demonstrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our old man and rising in newness of life to live in Christ. That is like Lazarus coming out. I bet after he got out of there in those grave cloths, he probably went and took a bath pretty quickly. Come on, Jesus, right? And Jesus' prayer to God the Father, he said, I'll repeat what I said earlier that the miracle was so that they may believe in the one who sent him. They may believe in God the Father. I'm praying that Jesus' prayer to the Father in that day would be answered yet again in this very room. That some of you might be hearing this story for the first time or it's penetrating your heart for the very first time and you're like, man, I believe on him who God sent. Jesus is the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again, that I might have life, that I might rise from the dead and spend eternity with him. John eleven forty five. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him, yet there were still some of the Pharisees who mocked. Do you believe? I said at the beginning that we're gonna come to a place of decision. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? There's two sets of people that I'd like to pray for before we close and before you.